Hello and welcome to the Carbon Copy Podcast Running Out of Time Special. I'm Isabel Sparrow and in this episode we are rejoining the relay after an incredible weekend which saw the baton being held by over 300 people from around the world at the Restore Nature Mark in London. The relay then continued back west with the baton being cycled 100 miles from Reading to Worcester on Sunday by Bike Worcester team members Dan and Rob. We'll hear more about how that went in a moment but first a reminder that Carbon Copy is the official podcast of the Running Out of Time Relay and we've already had the opportunity to talk to some incredible guests and to hear wonderful, inspiring and moving stories about action for climate and nature. If you'd like to relive any of the action so far, go back and check out our earlier episodes and do subscribe to hear the next ones as soon as they're released. So, back to today's episode and I had the delight of chatting to Dan and Rob from Bike Worcester earlier this month to learn about their wonderful local cycling initiative. Here they are with the story of how it all began. I'm Dan Broswell. I'm the chair of Bike Worcester. And I'm Rob Collier. I'm the secretary. And, um, and raison d'etre of Worcester is to ena- enable and encourage as many people as possible to make journeys by bikes. So we're not the sporty side of cycling. It's just using bikes as a mode of transport. I have the happy position of kind of being the lead coordinator for our bike bus programme which is getting groups of families and encouraging people to cycle to school together and addressing barriers that children and their parents have when it comes to the school run. We've got workshop space, uh, which w- enables us then to receive donated bikes from the community. Uh, and we give them a bit of TLC, give them a safety check and, and get them back out on the streets. So we're up to, oh, well, I don't know how many bikes we've had donated, maybe 200 or something and, and about 130 repaired and back out, which is great. That ties in really well with the bike buses. So lots of lots of them are children's bikes. So there's children without bikes that now have bikes. And also, which was a little bit unforeseen, but we get lots of mums who then uh, are given bikes. And there's nothing more rewarding than seeing those mums cycling into town on their way to work. We spend a lot of time chatting to councillors and city officers and county officers. Um, but that's not as much fun. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that's worth mentioning is we had two of our community members featured as part of Cycling UK's top 100 women in cycling uh, last year. And off the back of that, we have collected over 100 stories of women in Worcester who cycle uh, and then featured that on our website. So we did a kind of Worcester version of, of the top 100 women cycling. Um, and a big shout out to Fee Blake, who's our press officer, um, who coordinated that effort and all of the details are on the website. It's, it's some really great resource and some really powerful stories which we're really proud of what kind of led you to to set this up is cycling something that's always been a big part of your lives yeah well it's interesting so i yes for me so i i cycled to school i cycled to work i then got given a car and then used the car to drive to work and then the car failed its mot so i went back to a bike this is when i was in my 20s my wife was cycling to work every day and I was driving to work every day. And we had two friends, who Isabel and Terry, so they're both part of the Bike Worcester community. Uh, and it was 19 years ago, we decided to stop work and cycle around the world, which was very inspirational. And given at that moment, I thought, well, if they can cycle with fully loaded bikes, you know, 50 kilometres every day, I'm sure I could get off my ass and cycle to, to the office, which is about five miles away. Um, so I started doing that and got into that, got really got into the habit then of, of making a bike as my mode of transport. Um, my work is very supportive. Um, they set up a scheme six or seven years ago to encourage people to ride a bike as a mode of transport. So in actual fact, every kilometre I do, uh, the company donates two and a half pence to charity and that goes to various charities. So that's a scheme called Shift. Um, and on the back of shift, I thought, well, this is a this has been a really big success, and it was quite surprising how much that changed the culture of the business. Um, and at that point, I then started looking for the local cycling advocacy group to sort of join. And maybe five or six years ago, and, and it didn't exist. There wasn't one for Worcester. There seemed to be one in in lots of other cities, but not in Worcester. So that was the uh, that was how it, it grew out of that. I mean, I've I've cycled, you know, since I was a kid. It's always been quite a natural uh, mode of transport for me. I like it because it's quicker um, than, than driving often, especially for shorter journeys. And you know, 
I don't mind hanging around so oh, and or sitting in traffic. And so that was always the reason why I would choose a bike over a car as a natural as a natural choice. Um, you know, uh, there are environmental benefits, there are health benefits, but mainly it's because I like to get places quickly. The, the, my kind of journey into advocacy and into into kind of being more involved in Bike Worcester really started when um, my children started school. So my eldest son started school in Worcester uh, and that that brought a whole load of car travel into my family's lifestyle that we didn't have before because we had to start thinking about the school run. And I was extremely grumpy about the fact that the, the school run was too far to walk. My son wasn't really riding and we didn't really have the right kind of bikes to, to travel um, to school. And then that that the September when he started, he actually learned to ride a bike. And I thought, well, why don't we cycle to school? And found that that was actually a really, really challenging uh, with, a, with a child. And because, you know, when I'm cycling, I'm, you know, I'm kind of quite used to, to riding in the road, quite used to kind of navigating traffic. And obviously with a, with a five-year-old, that isn't possible. I found that really difficult and we were, you know, persevered quite a lot with it. And then over that, that first term discovered the, the bike bus kind of initiative from a group in Scotland that had quite an established scheme and thought that looks amazing. Let's give that a go. I get really emotional about this because hmm. like thinking about, um, like how that started is like ridiculous because I put a message out to our the reception group that we were in. I said, "Who wants to who wants to cycle to school with me?" And I had two of our really close friends now say, "Yeah, let's do it." And they were only tiny; they were five. They were all on balanced bikes. A couple of kids on scooters. And like this morning, we've been out on a bike bus, and we had like sixty people out in Worcester cycling to school together. And um, and it all started because you know me and a group of friends said, "Let's cycle to school together." And it's, it's just so, it's been so brilliant over the last couple of years, for, frankly, watching children ride their bikes, learning how to ride, being really motivated by it. You know, we're like celebrities in the school playground, aren't we, with some of these kids? Like, yeah. all they want to do is talk to us. All they want to do is tell us about that they can take one hand off the handlebar or, you know, how far they've cycled in, a, in, in that week or, or whatever it is. And it's been an absolutely amazing kind of experience just and listening to these people talk about that confidence and that freedom that they get from cycling. You forget how far we've come. And we've yeah. just done it this morning. We, we, I managed to get three bike buses in this morning at, just because of the way they work with the, with the different timings of the schools. And then we go for a coffee and we have a chat and, and we forget about the effort that it's taken to get to here. And what's interesting as well, it's all been done. It's not, it's, it's not been done with any permission from city council, county council, we've got schools, nothing from schools. nothing from the schools. It is literally just communities coming together and saying, "We're not happy with this." I think Point Worcester then ends up being the catalyst, which enables people to to get started on these things. The, the volunteer community. So this is a community there of of people whose children are older or haven't got children who are, who are coming out every day to to do the bike buses. You know, so they're they're. They're giving to their community and they're providing, but it's it's a massive it's massively supportive for them. I mean, the Friday the, we we always go for a coffee on a Friday after these these three bike buses that happen, and it's it's just a really nice environment to be in, isn't it? Yeah. So there's there's a there's a few big things for us over certainly over the next six months. We're very excited to have uh, a, a bike hire scheme launching in the city imminently. So that will happen over the next few weeks. Um, it's a scheme provided by Barrel, which will allow people to kind of hire a bike for a journey, you know, a bit like the Boris bike scheme in London. Um, so that's a really big thing for us. Um, and, you know, we're really looking forward to working with the city council to make that scheme successful. One of the, one of the big barriers in Worcester to, to cycling is that at the minute you can't cycle through the city centre during the day. So it's a pedestrianised area, and a bit unusually, Worcester is an outlier on this. That they uh, they not only prohibit motor vehicles, they also prohibit cycles. We're working to get that changed, um, and it is a it is a, it is a notable barrier. You either break that rule, or it's effectively cycling on a dual carriageway to navigate around the city centre, which is you know fine for me and Rob, you know racing racing across the city but 
it's a real challenge for again particularly family cycling with, with younger children is it part of your role at bike Worcester to sort of lobby a little bit around those kinds of um those kinds of laws and policies uh absolutely lobby a little bit uh yes we we we're, we're pretty vocal on uh, it, you know in every forum so we we regularly speak at city council meetings county council meetings i would say from the kind of lobbying and the more political side of bike Worcester's activities first and foremost we we kind of focus on you know encouraging and enabling and that leads to quite a lot of community work you know in some instances we created communities like around bike recycling and around the bike buses but also we get invited to lots of community events and school fates or and um, you know residents associations and things like that within the city and because of those you know and we're, we're really active and we're really in, involved because we, we know we really enjoy it and you know there's a lot of us who are quite sociable that gives us credibility it gives us influence to some degree and it, you know you meet you meet local champions at those events whether whether they're councillors or officers or, or just you know active residents and and we collaborate really well with those with those groups so from a, and that you know from when it when it comes to kind of you know lobbying we're essentially recognized as experts when it comes to traveling by bike and that you know and, and we're and we're really keen to be part of those conversations I loved hearing about this collaborative, community-focused approach and about what a huge impact these two are making for families and individuals across Worcester. It's really a perfect example of big thinking local action, which, in case you didn't know, is what Carbon Copy is all about. As I mentioned earlier, Dan and Rob took on a sizeable distance in the relay on Sunday afternoon, and here's some of the chat they recorded on the road. I'm Dan Brothwell, uh, and I'm on a bike ride with Rob. So, uh... Danny and I are three hours, three hours into a bike ride. We're just west of Oxford at the moment. We have teamed up with the running out of time relay. So today is Sunday and tomorrow for Baton we'll be visiting the University of Worcester. Wild about Worcester Way with Mr. Paul Snooks who's gonna do a little turn with the Baton and a few of the bike bus schools. And so Danny and I will be accompanying the Baton as it makes its way through Worcester and on to Malvern on Monday evening. And we've got the lovely baton on the bike now. So the running out of time relay team, we're looking for volunteers to get the baton from Reading to Worcester today. And given the weather forecast and our keenness for a big cycle, Danny and I have signed up. So we left Reading at six o'clock this morning with, like I say, we're three hours in, just west of Oxford, feeling pretty good about life. It sounds like they had a blast. The Relay Baton arrived in Worcester and on Monday, a whole range of different events took place with children, young people and students, organised by the University of Worcester. Here's a conversation about the day's activities and about some of the work the university is doing for climate and nature, recorded on our behalf by Media Relations Manager, Justin Sorrell. I'm Vic Tradiboali, sometimes known as Lord Vic Tradiboali. Hi, I'm Sally Moyle, um, sometimes known as Professor Sally Moyle. I'm Katie Boom, I'm the Director of Sustainability, always known as Katie Boom. <laughs> and I'm Justin Serrell from the University of Worcester. Today's a very special day. We've just come from Seven Campus, where the Running Out of Time relay came in, and it was just a wonderful sight to see that baton being carried by uh, and the banners coming through. Um, Victor, can I start with you? What did you think when you saw the, uh, the the procession being brought through the university? I thought it was great. It was quite touching, actually. You know, then we have the future, talking about the future. Isn't it amazing? It was, yeah, very good. It was just such a pleasure to see it all coming together. And everybody was so enthusiastic, weren't they? And we all we all felt touched, yeah. I think. It was, I very, it was lovely. Very important thing, really. I mean, at the end of the day... They're going to have to, it's the young people that are going to have to suffer the lack of attention paid to air pollution, the environment generally. So it's good to see them involved. And, and Sally, what sort of things is the University of Worcester doing for nature and to improve the situation for the climate? Well, we do a whole host of things led, of course, by Katie and the students. So the students rightly so expect us to help support climate action and also get involved. Many of our students do projects with our staff in the community. 
Um, for example, we look at affordable and clean energy. We look at getting involved around food sustainable. Our Sustainable Restaurant Association is, has a certificate um, which has been maintained at its highest ratings. Uh, we have a community cupboard for our students. We have a repair facility. Um, we have a cycle hire. So students, we encourage students to cycle to around the city rather than rather than take their cars. Um, so yeah, there's absolutely lots of things that we do with the community and within the university to support the sustainable um, action. Of course, and you mentioned about how how involved Katie is in that. I mean, Katie, when you're because you, you're sort of whenever I see you, you're you're bringing the students into this, and and it's very all in, all encompassing, and everyone is getting involved in it. It certainly is, and it's um, it's great fun co-creating with the students because they bring all their enthusiasm and some really good ideas. Mm. So you know. We haven't got all the answers. No one of us has. No one organisation, no one country. You know, we've all got to help each other. And by bringing different disciplines, different voices, all into the one space, we all learn from each other. And um, if I have my way, then we have a little bit of fun as well. <laughs> and they challenge us, don't they? They challenge, oh, they challenge, they challenge us, yeah. um, which is great. They hold us to account. They do and indeed. So they should. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And Victor, how do you factor climate change and, um, and issues around nature and sustainability? How do you factor that into your work? How important is it to you? Uh, well, it's the biggest challenge facing all of us. So I chair the NHS Confederation. Uh, um, it's the biggest challenge facing health. Um, the summer, this next week, the NHS will be putting out health alerts because in the southeast and in the Midlands, it'll be over 30 degrees. And, uh, and it's a horrible thing to say. People will die as a result. Um, I chair Social Enterprise UK, which is the fastest form of business um, in this country. Again, um, it's commercially, we we need to be in the leading, one of the leading countries in developing green business Um and I also am a businessman, co-founded a, a company called Visionable, which is part of changing the way we communicate. So we don't have to fly. We don't have to, we actually communicate using video technology, which can also help people um, providing health services. So everything I do in some way or another is connected with the future. I also chair the Institute of Public Policy Research. So, you know, it's it, everything I do somewhere, the environment is part of that work because it is the thing without the environment there is no humanity so <laughs> it's part of what i do sally what do you think it was that happened in life that made you think we really need to start taking the environment really seriously i think it's sort of for our generation for our age it's sort of grown over the years hasn't it so i think many of the young people they're aware of it right from the off they hear about it at primary school but we we didn't so for, for me, the university has working in the university and working with young people. I think that's really got me interested and in, and in, and in, and realizing it's just hearing it from our students and then hearing it from some of the initiatives that that go on. So probably working in the university has probably been a big driver for me personally. I mean, but I'm, you know, like our generation. I don't know how old you, Sally, and I know how old Katie is, but I won't say it out loud. I'm I'm 62. And it seems that our generation really had a bit of a party. Uh, you know, in, yeah. it wasn't a big issue. In fact, uh, but the only person who really cared about the environment, oddly enough, was King Charles. I was about to uh, say. seen as a bit weird talking yeah. to plants and tree hugging and all that. And it turns out he was spot on, regardless of what you think of the royal family. We, we've had a great time. And now the generation that were doing the, you know, running out of time, they've got five years, basically, to make a significant difference to the trajectory Otherwise, they're going to be living in a depleted world. And, you know, we had a party, and as I've said before, we're expecting them to get in the kitchen and clean up afterwards. And mm. actually, I'm surprised they're not more frustrated and more angry than they actually are because this is their lives and their kids' lives. So we owe it. We have a duty, actually, to actually make this an issue and to listen to them and help them tell the story and get the message across. Thanks so much to everyone who contributed to this episode. The Relay continues into Wales and we will pick up in Cardiff in a couple of days' time. The Carbon Copy podcast is written, presented, and for this episode, edited by me, Isabel Sparrow. Additional material recorded by Dan Brothwell, Rob Collier, and Justin Sorrell. If you've enjoyed this episode, please do consider leaving us a review. Thanks for listening. Until next time.